Time now for the Cliff Bar Extended Highlights. It's day two in the Alps for the Tour de France. It's day 12 of this amazing race as we continue with our live coverage of the Tour de France presented by Viking. It is wonderful weather high in the Alps. Now let's uh, take us through the Geico stage map, uh, Bob. This is an incredible route today. Starts in the town that's at the bottom of the Col de Granon, Briançon. Lotere is the first climb, but that swings straight into the Galibier. So that's all taken together for the first HC of the day. Down to the valley below that they ascended from yesterday. Over the Quad Affair, another HC and another beyond category HC to finish off an incredible day in the mountains. This is the Cathedral of the Mountain Angels, and I'm sure the Heavenly Choir will be singing all day. Approaching zero kilometer. and an, an immediate attack by Nielsen Paulus here, the American rider. Here's the quick update for you. 1,190 miles completed of the 22 teams, 10 are still complete, and the 35 categorized climb, there's 27 big ones still to come. Paulus on the move. Saw Nielsen near the race director's car in the neutral section, and I thought, wow, ha, that's a great idea. Go on the offensive, <laughs> and he's done just that. Another. Uh, few other specials I'm sure will try to get into the moves. The problem for the breakaway today, Phil, is the difficulties start a lot earlier than they did yesterday. The low terrain is a pretty tough climb. It's long, it's not steep, it's very gradual. You have to be absolutely flying to have even a reasonable advantage before the GC teams and riders swing off of this highway and onto the Galibier. Well, this is off to a very, very quick start. We started out of the blocks two minutes ahead of schedule right from the get-go today. And we're going to build on that for the moment. Five kilometres to the start of the climbs. And these sort of speeds, they're really working hard to cross the gaps. 33.3, uh, Nielsen Paulus' is group there. 29 by the peloton. They should be opening it up. They're trying to get this race together. A lot of riders off the front without Wout Van Aert. I would imagine he's going to cool it for the sprint today and save his energy to try to help Jonas. Oh, oh there's been a crash here. Right there. On the left of the road, and we've caught out. Kreuzweg. Yves Lampart, the rider in blue from the Quick Step Squad going down in the blink of an eye of fairways back. That's a tough break for Stephen Kreuzweg. Had a great day yesterday. I was saying that I would be surprised if Van Aert goes for these points. He wants to save all of his energy, I would imagine, to defend the yellow jersey, at least for today, for Jonas Fingerville. In the stages to come, when it's not as critical, we'll see how he handles those. The noise of falling riders, that little uh, instill the attack. We think it was a dog, but might be able, might be able to show you that picture now. This is Powers being joined by Chase Group. What's up? And there's a black dog down there. Uh, there's oh, he's an old Labrador. He's hardly got the legs to get across the road there. Eh? <laughs> he's, wow. been, he's walked right through the Tour it de France, none, only one rider fell. None the worse well, for wear. <laughs> no, Flying not at all. A couple no. of riders there. Uh, please, everybody, leash your dog when you come yeah. to the bike races. Watch for the green jersey to pip off the front. See if Jakobsen doesn't follow him. 
Try to get some green jersey points, but why not if nobody? Oh, there's a little movement there. It looks like Pierre Latour and Kristen Liss. This is to get into the breakaway. And I think that at this point, Walt Van Aert will decide, forget about it. Let you guys take the green jersey points. Yeah, the green jersey there. Just a group shoulders with somebody who tried to sprint off. I think it was Gesker who left his side, actually. Simon Gesker trying to get across for King of the Mountains leader. This is the sprint and no interest at all in who wins what. Six leaders are through. They're being chased by another group here, which could build. Geske was in that second chase, trying to get away before he gets up the col de Glibier. Chris Nielens, Israel on the front, followed by Roland. Might be Michael Woods, just on third bill there. Very strong climber. If he gets a couple of minutes up the road, whew, it's going to not be easy to catch him. Wow, I think Pierre Roland just sat out, stepped out of the line, not having it in the legs, and said, have a good day, fellas. It's so he makes in Intermarch, the Intermarché rider, white jersey, lime green highlights. Big group now trying to get across to this small group chasing the original breakaway. Menkes here is the rider we saw run over the finishing line with broken gears on the climb of La Planche de Belfi on stage seven. And he said it was a shame because he felt as though he had really great legs. He is a South African rider and is a very, very good climber on his day. And here comes Ralph Renard like a torpedo over the lot. Now, is he going up to that leading group? I'm not sure where he is. He's approaching. He's, He's gone minutes. straight over the top just for a few points. Two minutes down on the lead group, but he'll get a solid amount of points there. Wow, I didn't think that would happen, but no. once the peloton came close to the counter move, that is seventh place, so six riders up. He'll and get another cheeky. nine points. That is a cheeky move. He's let them all play around. He's got 250 meters to go. He'll still score. He's caught Jakobsen and everybody else on the hop. Uh, this man just adds to this magnificent lead he is building on stage 12 of the Tour de France. If the riders are a little bit confused what to do today, wait, attack, or do what? And because they know they're heading into the high mountains, the three high spots of the day. It's going to be a very hot, very hard fought day today. This man's job now to keep the race leader, Jonas Vingago, in yellow. So he'll be turned back to the bunch. Chris Froome on the offensive. My Great goodness. to see some in the big mountains. Chris Froome trying to get over to the breakaway. Wow, what a ride by. Froome, he must be feeling better than he's shown throughout this year's Tour de France. Now it looks as though the peloton is now on the lower slopes of the actual climb of the Galibier. There's the overall situation at the start this morning. Uh, this is Thibaut Pino in the white. It is red, white and blue. Thibaut Pino into Mejev a couple of days ago was very, very aggressive. Didn't quite work out. Looks like Tom Pitcock coming to the front in the yellow helmet from the Ineos team. They've got some clear daylight. So if Tom Pitcock is on the move, uh, there's Simon Geshka. Also, I, just at the bottom of the screen, the polka dots, still some points available. And some Ineos riders, two of them along with Pitcock in this group. So it might be that Ineos has a plan and they're starting to move some pieces up the road and try to join them later. I want to say that's Stephen Kreuzweg, also from Jumbo Visma. So uh, a lot of action. Slipping into fourth wheel, Thibaut Pino. Thinking that now is a moment where the GC riders will want to maybe ease back a little bit and see if Jumbo Visma doesn't have other plans. A little bit of a move here, Bob. This is Perez, I think. It is. Had a chance to go into the King of the Mountains jersey two years ago in the Cote d'Azur when the Tour de France had a delayed start because of the pandemic while he was in the virtual lead and all he had to do was get to the finish line to have polka dots he crashed and was out of the tour so he's got five just under five k's to go now so it shows you how long they've been climbing since the start phil and they're not even at the top of the first climb that shows you how hard this is the galibier 
Now there's the attack uh, moments ago by Anthony Perez. Remember, it is France's big holiday today, the storming of the Bastille celebrations uh, on the Champs-Élysées with the military there showing off. It's the only other time they close the Champs-Élysées, and that's for the, storm, the Bastille Day celebrations, and then, of course, the Tour de France as well. Perez not in the frame for points. But looking to get 20 just now. This is the eight places today on the three climbs in the King of the Mountains because the all category, which means outside category. If he goes over the next one in first position, Phil, he'll be right up there in the frame. Only a few points less than the leader. Absolutely. He'll have 40 against 43 unless Geshka gets up the road and gets some more points. That's a big hypothetical. <laughs> It could be quite a bit of racing before we get to the top of the quad affair. This Tour de France is far from ready to lay down because we saw an incredible day of racing, one of the best we've seen in years on the Tour de France, and there's every reason to believe that will come back again today. But they're all afraid of Alp Duez, and that's where it might unfold. He's finding the last kick here to get over and get the points. for Anthony Perez and remember for the first three days of the Tour de France we were talking about three points per day one point per climb uh, and he's just taken 20 that's going to put him into the classification leaderboard I think we'll check that out for you in a moment Ciccone nobody going to challenge him Menkes isn't going to bother Powerless isn't going to bother they're going for the long term today so don't throw your energy to the wind right now there's two more big climbs to come Pierre Latour going for it. This will be, I think, eighth position. He's uh, third in the competition, but moves himself a little bit closer to Simon Gishka. Getting those, just getting a couple more. Kreuzweek, the next rider to come across, and no sign of Simon Gishka. And so deciding that that wasn't entirely worth it, or maybe just keeping an eye on Barguil. Didn't see Barguil move, so cooled his jets for that particular sprint. But I think there were nine guys ahead of the peloton led by Walt Van Aert. Yeah, and take a look at this peloton, Bob. It's been not a difficult climb. Such a big bunch of riders going over together. Geraint Thomas, who told us earlier when we heard him chat, uh, that he thought the race might be controlled early on. I think they want uh, an easier day after yesterday and fight it out, possibly on Alpe d'Huez. On the switchback, you've got to hammer the brakes. Unless you're Tom Pitcock. <laughs> oh my goodness! You this might man be... is one of the most skilled bike handlers. He's only 23 years old. He's the world Olympic, he's the world champion uh, road rider. He's also the Olympic mountain bike champion. Oh, this could be quite dangerous for anybody without his skills to try to follow in the peloton, prudently not doing that. He oh. just left a big group led by Wout Van Aert. And he's got clear daylight, so he's opened up a big advantage in just a few corners, Phil. Tom is on a mission here. He's been told by the team to get up there. Well, on the descent, he might be the only rider that could do that. Nielsen Paulus right. is getting really close to the edge there. Swapping with Ciccone and Menkes. All of these riders well experienced in the mountains of the Tour de France and the other Grand Tours. And they need all those skills to get down these descents at these breakneck speeds safely. Still on the snow line, which come in usually in October here at this height. the inertia hits you right behind your belly button on these switchback turns You've got to hammer the brakes you go from about 50 to about 25 in the lowest amount of time that you can do so you want to wait to the last possible moment swing from the outside try to grab as much apex as you can 
and hope that you don't run out of roadway. Tom Pitcock so skilled. The apex is the very most inside part of the corner. So you can see the rider swing to the inside and let their momentum carry them to the outside of the turn. And this is when you start to feel as close to flying as a human can. The skill of this man, Pitcock Tom, he's gonna he's gonna catch up with those leaders. Christian. I just can't quite see Chris Shrews yet. Chris used to be a terrible descender, but he learned the art. Remember how he won into Luchon. That's Froome first around. Chris Froome in the blue, and Tom Pitcock was about 30 seconds behind, just about two, <laughs> two miles ago, and now he's right on the wheel. Let's see if Froome is willing to take the chances required to stay with Tom Pitcock for the rest of this descent. That is Nouvelle who was in the breakaway and passing on the outside incredibly dangerous. He had to have amazing skills to be able to pull that off safely, Phil. He just cruised by. Now he's going to come up. Look at that pass. That's a brilliant pass. Perfect control. Taking that corner like a ski racer. He'll go right straight past Froome. But let's see what Froome does to try to make it as safe as possible. But sometimes if the road narrows up on you, and right on the inside there. Oh my gracious, as Froome is braking, Pitcock just lets off the brakes just for an extra second and then gets around him. I'm not sure that Froome will be 100% happy with that. Let's see if Froome doesn't be able to stay with Pitcock, but gosh, Pitcock on a mission. Great bike handler and making it very difficult on Chris Froome to stay on the wheel. You know, back in 2016, when the organization were trying to stop Chris Froome winning all the Tours de France, they threw a descent into Luchon at the finishing line at the bottom because they knew his weakest thing was descending. So what did Chris do? He broke away on the way up and he put in incredible defense, racing into Luchon, a lone winner of the stage. Impressive chase, this. back. Ten seconds now. Oliveira, number 66, trying to get back. He was with those riders yeah. on the climb. Yeah. And Kobe Gosens also, and Schoenberger. So about to get back on turns with the riders that dropped him on the climb. And on this descent, not undoable, but on the next climb, it might be tough to stay in that group. Rider upper left in our picture there. He's gone past these riders on the climb, Chacone. He joined the leaders, and now these three are going to make a leading group of seven by the time they get it together. But the chase of two riders behind, just over half a minute now for Tom Pickcock and Chris Froome to try and gain contact. Wow, they just took four seconds out of them in about yeah. 10 pedal strokes. So that's impressive chasing by these two riders, yeah. Froome and Pitcock. And it's advantage them, but it's advantage Froome now for the moment. Yes. Because we're on the climb to the top of the telegraph before we continue to descend again. Maybe a chance to close that gap. Now it's advantage Chris Froome and Tom Pickler can't hold on to the seat of his shorts. And you can take over on the descent. 309, so Peloton not in full cry, that's for certain. Breakaway finally coming together with some numbers, Phil. This is going to be a strong group when Pitcock and Froome catch these guys. We have nine leaders now still descending from the top of the Col de Glibier. This is the man that started all of the racing today. This is Nielsen Paulus Bob at the zero kilometer when the flag came in. He was out of the racks like a rabbit and he's been joined now by eight of the riders. Up from the jump, Nielsen Paulus went and he's still at the front. Anthony Perez did get the KOM points on the Glibier, but Nielsen Paulus having a very good day and putting in a pretty impressive descent also. We'll hold off Tom Pitcock in these twists and turns and his steep descent down to the valley below in Saint-Jean-de-Maurienne, the next town on the race course. Pretty impressive ride in by Nielsen Palace. Great climber, but also proving himself to be a solid descender. Proving to be an excellent descender, Nielsen Palace here. 
He's been as high as second overall during the first week of this year's Tour de France, and he remains a challenger here. Take a look at the profile. The darker colour is behind us now, but you can see the long, long descent of the Col de Glibier bring us down to the valley before we start climbing again up the giant Col de la Croix de Fer, which is a horrible climb for anybody. And that's where the next battle will be enacted. 100 kilometers are still to go, 62 miles still to race. Paulus has been joined now by, oh, oh my goodness me, he scraped the wall there, Bob. Wow, that was so close by Pitcock, and you definitely get the feeling he's taking chances. He'll try to get around Nielsen Paulus and continue this breakneck descent. My goodness me, look at that. As he's, uh, he is a brilliant bike handler. He is the Olympic mountain bike champion. He knows how to ride his bike. He's had an incredible chase across the Alps to catch up with Nielsen Paulus. Now he's happy to go down the hill as best he can with him. Still a long descent. Shock to the system there for Tom Pitcock. I'm sure we recover from that pretty quickly <laughs> and carry on these switchbacks proven to be a lot quicker than anybody else in the group that he's with. Just sneaking around Nielsen Palace, not always the most popular move. You basically have the same objective, get down safely, but Pitcock trying to put pressure on, on the descent field. Don't see that very often. He's now gonna demonstrate to Nielsen just how to descend, watch this. But doesn't take a turn, that's really upsetting. So they're just onto the lower slopes now, the Col de la Croix de Fer. It goes on a bit, this one, quite a long way, 29 kilometers, up to nearly 5,000 feet. The average gradient just over 5%. We have one American here. There's the King of the Mountain standings at the moment. Geshka, 43 points, uh, and there are 20 more points for the competition at the top. Seven minutes, 10, so it's crept up a little bit again. Now, Peloton, you can see by the tail, Bob, that they they're showing this picture again, but riders, it's a flashback again to that banner. I'm not sure why we're seeing it again. Our pictures come to you from French television, by the way, but there's nobody dropping off the end. We're on the quarter, quarter of the Bob. There is no action here from the peloton reflecting on the lights. Peloton showing a lot of respect for yesterday, the attacking days in the first week, and especially today. Christophe Laporte showing a lot of respect for the solar ra radiation just bearing down. Chris Froome as well. Hot day out there. Hydration and cooling is going to be a huge difference in how you feel on the last climb. Hours and hours in the hot sun in the saddle today is the order. Hydration is temporary solution to that five kilometers three miles to the top of the climb this is one of the steepest sections we're on a, a gradient now of 10.6 percent and the pressure applied by tom pickcock who chased and joined this group with chris Froome along the valleys after the col de galibier impressive move by pickcock splintering the front group pickcock has a chance on the next descent to really extend what might be his best chance to win the stage. Wow, this is a good push. He could really put some serious time onto the other riders in the breakaway on the descent of the Quad Affair and maybe have enough to hang on to the finish of Alpdoez. Time will tell, 6.26, so the Peloton's starting to increase their tempo, and Pitcock acceleration there has not brought him any further away from the Peloton, so it seems like now the maximum advantage has stabilized to the breakaway. Warren Barguil getting dropped. Woo! The most aggressive rider from yesterday, Phil. So the pace is hot in the peloton. I'll tell you what, why the boys were having a very friendly chat, I might add. Watch this now, because we're seeing riders from UAE. This is Brandon McNulty here being unhitched by the race itself now. And one by one, we've lost uh, quite a few riders now including Rigoberto Uran. You can see the slopes of the Quad Affair now steepening, and already the gap has come down to 5.24. We still have five riders at the front. The leaders on the steepest part of the climb just now. They'll be looking for the one kilometre to climb. Then we'll plunge to the valley, and we'll race along the valley to turn up the Alp itself.
Jumbo Visma. This is, a, I'm sure, a plan. Ride reasonably. Don't worry about the breakaway. And closer to the top of the quad affair, start turning the thumb screws on everybody. Bardet, Quintana, Pogaccia. Why not put the hammer down on Ineos now? The stages to come, not that difficult. These are the modern times when they know each team every single mile of the race and when time can be gained and when it can be lost. Today is a day where you can gain time and Jonas Vingigo is going to be all over this opportunity just like he was yesterday. There's the situation overall. With David Gadu, the best place Frenchman in seventh place. Well, along with Bardet, of course, is up in second place. Always big crowds on top of the Cold Affair. Survivors going up towards the fence will show you the situation in the King of the Mountains. Guests are still in at 43. Latour, Bogil, Vingago, and Perez. Perez has been dropped from the leading group, so will score maybe or maybe not at the moment. 20 points anyway, first man over. But you know, Simon Gesture could be surviving through this second stage in the in the Alps, rather. That would be pretty amazing. <laughs> it would be absolutely amazing over this with all these five HC category clubs. in that blue jersey number 191 going in the breakaway attacking the field we haven't seen that this is the most significant day since his massive crash before the tour de france three years ago phil absolutely right he was taking off a jacket apparently riding no handed a gust of wind hit a wall and he did a lot of damage teach Benoud on the front while van art on his wheel nathan van hoyadonk interestingly has peeled off the front not the best climber on the Yumbo squad, and now the gap coming inside of five minutes. He gave them a good pull up the climb there, Nathan and Hoidonk, but he's done for the day perhaps now. They're nearly at the top of the second big climb of the day. This is the shot I always remember on the top of the Calder Quadrefer. Ciccone has gone forward. He gets the points ahead of Paulus on the climb and Louis Menkes over the top of the Quadrefer in third place. Tighten down your bootstraps. If Tom Pitcock goes to the front and drills it on this descent, it's going to be harrowing for the riders around him and for the viewers across the globe. This is the lead group, Powell's on the back here. We do get those long straights before we go into the switchbacks. Just under 30 miles left to ride. Powell's got, puts his hand up, probably wants a drink. He's been at the front since this race started over three and a half hours ago. Chicone on the front, taking a turn. Chris Froome just on his shoulder. Former yellow jersey in the Tour de France. A couple of years ago when the race finished on Planche de Belfi, that win, stage win taken by Dylan Toons, but the rider on the front, white helmet, is 
took out the yellow jersey that day away from Julian Alaphilippe, who gained it back just a couple days later. And number one, Teddy Pogaccia following the Yumbo train. He does not want to let too many too many riders get between him and his rivals, especially that rider, Yumbo Wiesman. Yet Wild Van Art with a couple teammates gets a little advantage. It's going to take a big effort to get back on terms. Don't want to do that. Want to save everything for the final climb. Well, he hasn't come off the front since he brought them over the top. It's his job now to lead them to the base of the Alp by the look of it for Val Van Aert. Camera from the helicopter swings around. No sign of the leaders yet. Down to five riders now. The peloton greatly reduced in those last two kilometres up the hill. 58 miles an hour for the leaders. If they were on Sean Yates' wheel, that'd be over 60. But they might get there. Tom Pitcock closing in on 60 miles an hour, Phil. He's there it is. is. First rise. Motorcycle would do well to move forward, stay out of the way of Tom Pitcock. That's going to be hard to do, Phil. That could be very dangerous. Chris Froome seems to be up to the task trying to chase Pitcock. Huh. Little trickier and very high speeds, obviously. Desperate moments to get to the foot of the Alp. tribute to the great cameraman on Absolutely. the back of those motorbikes, the way they hold those pictures. Never ceases to be amazing. The shots that they get. Unbelievable. This is a this is what we're talking about. This descent. Pitcock, his skills on the mountain bike and cyclocross yep. suiting him well on this descent. They suited him well on the previous descent when he's able to go from the Peloton to the breakaway. Is himself a, huh, taking it, a drink on a, on, a, on a chicane since the cobble stage going 50 plus a little thirsty drink of water <laughs> and just imagine when you could sit on the top tubes how fast they would be going that rule the UCI for better or worse I disagree with it but you cannot sit on the top tube anymore to get extra low I did not find it and I still don't find it any more dangerous than sitting on the saddle Unless you're turning when you just pop on the saddle, make the corner, get back into the super tuck. Look at the way his elbows, his hands are onto the handlebars there. Not close to the brakes, by the way. No. <laughs> Trying to be as aero as possible. We've just gone under 15 kilometers to go. Hang on, we're going to swing onto the Alp any second now. Chris Froome, Giacconi, Pitcock, Menkes, and Paulus. These are the boys. Remember, Chris Froome, not just the only stage winner in this breakaway group, but he's four times the Tour de France winner. He's finished second, and he's finished third, and he's back. The team already has a stage win. That would be absolutely phenomenal in Bastille for the third time. Wow, Chris Froome. I, I just, I have a feeling that he's going to be very, very pleased with his chance to win the stage, and if he has the strength to do so, and... After not showing a lot, I think he, that would be really, I mean, I'd be absolutely astounded, as amazing as anything I've ever seen in cycling. Well, let's not forget that Chris Froome is the man who is coming back from serious injury, which was played down by the team, but nonetheless, it kept him out after his terrible crash. It was in the Dauphiné, the race before the Tour de France in 2019. A four-time winner at the time, looking for a fifth victory in the Tour de France and joined a special club. He was taking his jacket off and a crosswind took him into a brick wall while he was warming up for a time trial in the Dauphiné. Here we go, we swing 13.8 kilometres of sheer purgatory. We have 21 hairpin bends. We hit the highlight, it's not that far high at 3662, but it is the quality of the climb. The gradient is steep. And get, by the way, let's give you the king of the mountain standings. Gesture 43, Giacconi has come into the play here now. He needs points up this climb to take the lead overall. Could very well take the king of the mountains. 
The points available, 20, 15, 12, 10, 8, and 6 for this group. So if he gets any of those, he'll go he'll either he'll be tied or go into the lead of the King of the Mountains competition. And that's the rider in the dark blue jersey with the white helmet. Chris Froome, Louis Makis. This is the most difficult gradient-wise part yeah. of the climb. It goes straight up for almost a kilometer You're and right. a half, and then the switchback start. However, the higher you get up on the mountain, the more difficult a climb is because of the fatigue that sets in. These are the steepest gradients, but not the hardest part of the climb, that's for sure. Pressure applied by Giacconi. He knows if he can stay away, he can be the leader in the King of the Mountains. That'll be a big result for 172 at the front. Menkes is a really good climber on the front in this retake. Oh, well, did well. Wow. That's a pretty good shot. No fine for that. No. <laughs> you know what? He should get a bonus from that, from the UCI. Absolutely. <laughs> Two points there. Yeah. Great sportsmanship <laughs> by Tom Pitcock. And that means he's very lucid, so he might be, might be up for the fight for the stage win. Well, the man who's going to get the most aggressive rider of the day has to be Nielsen Powers because he's been in the lead from zero kilometre. He's now 13 from the finish at the back at the moment in the pink jersey, but has tried to keep his breakaway uh, up front all day, agitating all of the time. Ciccone setting the pace. Menkes. Supported throughout his early years by U.S cycling and the u.s cycling foundation nielsen palace from just outside of sacramento part of the oneida nation first native american heritage rider to participate in the tour de france the man in the pink jersey on the wheel of chris Froome. depending how he's feeling it's about as good a chance he'll have to win a stage in the tour de france so far in his career plenty of those to come for sure from the californian on the ef squad in the pink jersey Chris Kroom, is, he said to us, he said, I'm not like I used to be because I'm coming back from the crash, but I feel I've reached a level now where I can search to choose a day to win the stage. He has chosen it today, and he didn't go with the breakaway. He came across to it with the rider in the red tops of his jersey, Tom Pitcock. Oh, Kroom, maybe a little bit of trouble, maybe easing back to sit on the wheels through this switchback, but starting to open up gaps a little bit. Nielsen Palace will want to take close measure of that, not get gapped off. Louis Menkes has to be careful also. He doesn't want to show his cards too early, that's for sure. In fairness, in his heyday, Chris Room always looked like he was absolutely shattered. And he does today as well. His face gives nothing away. He has this ungainly riding style. It's not a great stylist on the bike, uh, but he is very, very effective as a rule. Meanwhile, the race for the next yellow jersey in the Tour de France is in this group here. Now coming down to Borg Doison at 6 minutes 17 deficit. They'll make a turn to our right very shortly and head up the Alp themselves. Ooh. Oh, Nilsson Paulus. This is tough to watch. Looks like opening these gaps, not a good sign this far from the finish line. 12 kilometers to go and Chris on Froome also, if my eyes don't deceive me. Well, they don't, but Chris always looks absolutely tired, so maybe he's just hanging there, glued to that wheel in front. Powers, for my money, is fighting back. This is the tempo set by maybe the best climber in this group, Louis Menkes, shelling at least one and maybe two riders at the moment. Oh, you do not want to get clipped by the motorbike. You could go down in the blink of an eye. This is the fish the, the early parts of the hard parts. You've got to hang on in there as Froome is trying to do at the moment. Pidcock looking over his shoulder to see what's happening. Is he going to decide to lift the pace a little bit more? 5.47, there is a, a reduction of time gaps, but it's not very significant yet. Powers has climbed himself back into this race. He's turning out to be a superb rider. All back together again. The same five at the front have regrouped. Pitcock has been the man driving the train at the front. The ticket collector is Nielsen Powers for the moment. Pitcock just stopped pedaling for a moment. Not sure if uh, tactical or physical. Well, he still can feed for another about eight kilometers or so until 5k's to go 
And so maybe going back to the team car for some more hydration. You don't want to open up too much of a gap because then you'd have to work to close that. Ineos car just behind with the bikes on top. So you want to definitely make sure you don't open up too much of a gap on a climb like this, Phil, before you get a water bottle. Chris Froome to the front. Yeah, Froome went to the front after Pitcock swung off. Remember, they came across this breakaway together. They're on rival teams, but they know each other pretty well. Trouble for the rivals of Vingago at this point. If you attack right now, Phil, to gain time in the closing miles, so many guys could chase you down and close in those gaps. I'm not sure if there's going to be a lot of big attacks at least until this field isn't whittled down quite a bit, Phil. And there's an attack now. Pitcock just turning the screw. There's a reaction from Louis Menkes. That's why he swung off. A few deep breaths now. He's going to see who can go with him up this climb. Menkes is after him. Froome is trying to get on terms. The other two may be in difficulty. Paulus and Ciccone. Pitcock in his first Tour de France. Ciccone going off the back, taking Nielsen with him, but Chris Froome is fighting back with Louis Menkes. Chris Froome is being driven by the fact he wants to show the world he's not a has-been. That crash has not ruined his life. He is going to be a player again in the Tour de France. Peacock, young, first time ever in the Tour. He's got to know the depth that Chris Froome goes to to win. Just 22 years of age, he'll turn 23 just after the Tour finishes. And what a recollection of the tour if he wins the Alpe d'Huez stage, Phil. He's round the Welsh corner. That's the Welsh corner. No Geraint Thomas, though. It is Tom Pidcock from Yorkshire. Ciccone clearly dropped. Does, doesn't look like he's able to fight back. Louis Menkes may be the only rider to get back to the acceleration of Tim, Tom Pidcock. Menkes very clever, knows the tempo he's capable of riding within himself and slowly grinding his way back to that big acceleration by Tom Pitcock. He can be forgiven for being a little overly exuberant. He's just 22 years of old, years of age, in his first tour, Phil. This is Nielsen Palace, a man that started it all today, and he's only 10 kilometers from the finish. Froome fighting back. He, as, he will, as he will, because he'll gamble at Pitcock. Full of youthful exuberance. He's never raced about the race. Pitcock through will hang on in because he knows just how far it is to go. Van Aert has gone. He's done his job for the day. Come on, my goodness me, Vout. You're going to make the top now because his legs have just left him. Catch his breath. Get Ooh. the spin going. He'll be at the top in no time. Uh, perfect riding by Walt Van Aert today. 100% commitment to the success of the team. Now he's got to get home. Handing the bottle to Croy to his teammate. That's Roglic. Good riding by Wild. <laughs> He's unbelievable. You could not get, you could eh? not invent a better teammate than Wild Ben. No, you could not. Well, Pinkock seemed to be going into a bad place there, but he's got out of it. The crowd have lifted him. He's racing up towards the, the actual English corner here. And this rider now has never climbed up the res in a race before. He's absolutely flying to the summit. Still 4.6 miles to go. But he doesn't look like a man who's getting tired to me. He's still holding five minutes on at the yellow jersey group. Ineos looking for their first stage win at this year's tour. A little surprising to say that this deep into the race, but Pitcock could be the man to deliver it. Well, all the players in the game are right here now, but can they move forward? Because this pace has been incessant by Jumbo Visma. I'm wondering if the Tour de France hasn't been so arduous up to this point, Phil, that nobody has the strength to attack, and they're happy just to follow the pacemaking by the Jumbo squad. I don't think they've got any choice at this moment in time after that uh, terrific race we saw yesterday. They've had a reasonably quiet day, don't forget. There's been a breakaway on all day. They haven't attacked. There hasn't been a single attack uh, from any of the race leaders. Quintana has unhit Link from the train. Gadu has unhitched from the train. Desperate moments. Changes afoot. Gadu in big trouble. He's had a great Tour de France so far, but now he's definitely been dropped. Enrique Moss riding a little bit better. Bardet is still there with Yates and, and Garay Thomas. Now it's getting to be an incredibly tough tempo. David Gadu had a great ride yesterday. He's just about holding on to the coattails of that select little bunch at the moment. 
but in three and a half miles to the summit, he could lose here. This is Enrique Mast, the big Spanish hope, on the back. Curry's week did his turn. Now he's about to get dropped, I would imagine. Roglic is absolutely flying. Oh, he's dragging this race now. He's got Adam Yates and uh, Geraint Thomas, the two British boys in here, while their teammate, the youngest boy at the loss, is right up front on his own still. Tom Peacock. They've done the damage. And they maybe need to ease off a little bit. If they keep going this hard, that gives Teddy Pogaccia a chance to put Vigago in trouble. This is the leader on the road. He won't be the leader of the Tour de France, but Tom Pickup might be one day because people say he's a man for the future, and he certainly is right now the man for Alpe d'Huez. Welcome to the outskirts of Alpe d'Huez, and the crowd absolutely on fire. Roman Bardet in trouble, second in the overall standings. Well, this could mean that Tadi Pogaccia at least will move up back into second place, if not the yellow at the moment. There's the standings this morning. Just a few seconds, and Pogaccia will be up to second. Just Moss, Adam Yates, Garrett Thomas, and Tadi Pogaccia left with the duo from Jumbo Visma. Sepkus on the Dutch team through the Dutch quarter. Tadej, excuse me, Jonas finger go right on his wheel. But the, the tempo's been so hard, I think that if Jonas is not at 100% his best, yeah. Pogaccia could put in a, an attack that might get some team back. Back to the leader. Let's hope that the motorbike can keep the crowd just far enough away from Pitcock to keep him safe. That looks very, very nerve-wracking. This is Koos, last man standing for the yellow jersey team here. It's going to be Vingago and Pogaccio one-on-one -on -one very shortly. How much long can Seth Koos lead this before he becomes one-on-one -on -one right against yellow? Wait for it, he's getting twitchy, he's going for it, he's come out, there's your answer, Koos comes off, and Yellow has to chase White. Jonas Finger go right on the wheel, Tadej Pogaccia sensing a moment, he might be able to get a little bit of an advantage, but Finger go covers that immediately, great riding by the Yellow jersey. 3.1 kilometers to go, the White jersey has attacked the Yellow jersey, he wants his jersey back. He's already up to second place, and now it is Vingago on the defensive. Yesterday, it was the other way around. Look at the face of Tadej Pogaccia. I've never seen such determination. Vingago looks to be suffering the last time we got a chance to see his face. Tadej Pogaccia starting to grimace a little bit, but Vingago has made it so far. Let's see if Pogaccia can't put in another couple of accelerations. Might actually be able to get some space between him and the yellow jersey and he would use that all the way to the finish line to press his advantage these two amazing cyclists have blown away everybody else in this group Darren thomas is coming across and then you go now just Respond to every acceleration he's capable of for Tade. If you got the legs, keep on attacking. Garrett Thomas, wow, what a ride to get back on terms with the two rivals in front of him. He's taking advantage of that close ride. We actually did it yesterday. He's done it again today. But Thomas never say never won the Tour de France already. Because the pace has slowed slightly, Sepkus has come back and immediately goes to find his team captain and give him a hand. Sepkus's tempo was so ferocious that it dropped everybody except a couple of the GC contenders, including Moss, Garrett Thomas, and Tadi Pogaccia. Spectacular defense of the yellow jersey by both Fingigo and Sepkus. But this is the man about to make history. Thomas Peacock from Great Britain, chased by Louis Makies. They'll stay away from the field 
but I don't think Makings is able to catch Careful. Tom Pidcock by the end. 35 seconds, you never know, he might get inspired. This is the re this is the breakaway, and Enrique Massa's recovered from the acceleration of Pogaccia. He's come back on board now. Enrique Moss starting to get into a little trouble. He was on the wheel of Sepp Kuss when they recaught, but now Enrique Moss finding that maybe a little bit too difficult. Wow, what a ride by the Durango, Colorado native Sepp Kuss. Lives just outside of Andorra nowadays, but doing a great job for Jonas Vingigo and Roman Bardet further down the mountain, definitely losing second place. Might be losing his position in the top three also at the end of the day. Two kilometers to go. There's the contour, the black of the steep sectors. We finish in the red. Stand by to catch the riders as they cross the line. They give 110% there. Seb Kuz trying to guide yellow. Enrique Moss struggling now, losing time. Garen Thomas riding so well right there with Pogaccia and Vingigo, but Vingigo, wow. Could still have a teammate at this point. That's impressive. Two kilometers, just over a mile for Louis Menke. Still chasing the lone leader, Tom Pitcock. Brilliant riding by Sepp Kuss. Dropped on the acceleration, came back, and straight back into the chair to drive the yellow jersey. Well, if you saw that lovely feature we did on Pogaccia, Pogaccia himself says you cannot win the Tour de France without a team. And this is a great team now. Sepp Kuss guiding yellow, his teammate. And poor Tade Pogaccia has no teammates here. The tempo set by Sepp Kuss is so fast that Moss has dropped and no one can attack. As long as Sepp is at the front, watch for the attacks to be at least neutralized and maybe not snuffed out entirely. Four riders challenging for the top in this little group here. A young man unknown to anybody who didn't follow, who doesn't follow the Tour de France, Tom Pitcock, one of the youngest riders in the race, looking set to become the youngest ever man to win on Alcaraz. Here he is. We've been climbing this uh, mountain since uh, for 70 years this year, and he would be the youngest man. He's not 23 years of age until the 30th of July. Just and another hit, and here we go again. At least we can say Tadej Pogacar is not going to lose his yellow jersey or his tour without a fight. This time it's a tremendous acceleration. Only Vingago can match it. Where is he finding this from, Bob? Flat out sprint by Tadej Pogacar. Last time he hesitated after Vingago closed the gap down. He needs to continue to press on and continue to accelerate. Vingago up to the measure at the moment. A little wry smile on the face of Pogaccia. Massive nail back by the yellow jersey. One on one is two great riders. Time for the breather. And the boys are just blown away. Can grind their way back to their sides if they can. Garrett yeah, right. is trying to catch up again. Not that far from the finish. So you wonder if Tadej Pogaccia's next attack it doesn't put paid to Garrett Thomas, at least for the stage, but very good riding by the veteran from the Ineos squad, Garrett Thomas. He's got to have some great morale. He knows his teammate is about to win the stage. And he knows he himself is going to get into a podium position in the overall in third place if he continues like this. They're under 2K to go now, and Pidcock must be around about the one kilometer to go mark. Well, here he comes at Tom Peacock, his first Tour de France. He had to race across to join the leader, and he's just raced out of a picture. We have no control over the picture, of course, but Peacock will see him finish in a moment. Fausto Coppi set the trend here on the slopes of Alpe d'Huez in 1952, 70 years ago, and now Tom Pitcock, in his first Tour de France, becomes the youngest rider ever to win at the stage of here, and he can't believe it. Pitcock wins the day. Oh, what a wonderful situation with Tom Pitcock. Meanwhile, the battle for yellow continues. Is there one more kick? 
and Tade Pogaccia in white. Enrique Boss closing the gap down in the blue jersey. Here comes second place. Louis Mankies will take up the next. Look at this. Five bonus and set. Curse has got back on turn. They slowed down. They've climbed back into the action again. Now, give yellow and white a breather. And let's see if Pogaccia has got one last attack in him to gain a few seconds. This is Louis Mankies second on Alp Duez. Next in the road should be Chris Froome. Phil, what a ride by Chris Froome. That's Absolutely. the best he's ridden since his big crash and injuries three years ago. He will be so, so happy on this iconic day, this iconic climb. We'll wait and see if Chris can hang on to that third place. But will Taddy Pogaccia have one more go at the yellow jersey? Knowing this kid, I think he will. doesn't go one more time a little closer to the finish that Chris Froome right in front of them might be losing his third place so that would put four no. seconds up for grabs here comes Froome this is Froome so no time bonus that's another rider we haven't we definitely lost track of Phil from the early breakaway it is he's still coming back but that is definitely Chris Froome riding to third place at the moment only two riders have crossed the line Sepp Kuss has clawed his way back to his team leader twice already. As he goes under one kilometre, he's still with him. But welcome, Chris Froome, four-time winner of the Tour de France. A serious crash in 2019 wrote him out of the script until today. This is going to really make everybody extremely happy. Chris Froome, welcome back. Hats off to Nielsen what a ride. He started the whole thing at zero kilometers today. And the stage winner was dropped first, but he fought back fourth on the stage. Wow, what time. a good ride by Nielsen Palace from the EF squad. That's his second, fourth place. Well done, Nielsen Palace. He'll be voted the most aggressive rider today for sure. Now, eyes down. At the moment, there's going to be time. no change in the order for the Pergam in Paris, it, but will Tade go one more time? Bardet, Bardet trying Bardet. to fight back. Chicone from the breakaway just caught by Sepp Kuz. So it a pretty a sprint. Let's see if Tade Pogaccia doesn't try to get some daylight on the next corner. And a sprint just a couple of hundred meters from the finish line, Phil. But he did try, Tade Pogaccia, but he found Vingago was up for the move. And Vingago still up for the move. He's checking where he is. But the way he's lying off there, I think Pogaccia's going to try and grab a second. And here he goes, to the middle. They've seen him now. Vingago is so much switched on. Watch him, Pogaccia. Pogaccia goes clear. He's going to get same time on the line. There's not a, not a hair between them. With the one and all, oh, there's a gap. He's not big enough. They are same time. But you've got to take a hat off to the white and the yellow jersey. They're unbelievable bike riders. What a battle all the way to the line. Bardet fighting back strongly. Trying to keep his position in the top three. He might just do that, Phil. Well, if that was a fight back, if he doesn't, take your hat off to uh, Roman Bardet. Because he's at uh, uh, these moments in the tour, he's been the king of the mountains. This is Adam Yates, lost a little bit of ground here, but still very much in the picture. They always say if you have a rough ride in the Alps, you usually have a good ride in the Pyrenees, and they're still to come. All right, stage 12 results. Thomas Pidcock, first time a winner for the 23-year-old from Great Britain. And Chris Froome, first time he's finished in the top three since all the way back in February of 2019. That was just before that horrific crash that he was in in June of 2019 at the Dolphin End. Sade Pogacar there at fifth, just behind him, the man in yellow, Jonas Vingago. Both Pogacar and Vingago, three minutes and 23 seconds behind. And a little over three minutes ahead of Jonas and Sade, Tom Pidcock, the winner. As I mentioned, he's been in the top ten for most of this tour, but he's just getting his Grand Tour career started. The only other time he's ridden in a Grand Tour, last year at the Vuelta, and he finished 67th. This kid's resume... And stock just continues to go skyrocket straight up. This is a guy who they really said they weren't even going to put him into the Tour de France. And he, until he really had the chance of winning, put him in a little bit early this year, who knows what the future has in store for him.
take a look at the yellow jersey standings. Some changes, but not at the top. Vinga goes lead over Paganchar, 2.22. Tade moves up from 3-2, to two, and Garrett Thomas moves up from 4-3. to three. Bardet drops down to 4 from his previous spot at 2. Page 2, Nairo Quintana leading the way there, and Thomas Pidcock, the stage winner, in at 8. He's back into the top 10 as he was, had dropped down to 11th before the start of this day. Jonas Fingago to start tomorrow in yellow for the second time of his career. A lot easier stage tomorrow. They'll be quite happy, especially the guys in the Gruppetto who probably haven't even finished as of yet. Be happy to see that it's a lot flatter profile going into tomorrow's stage. But Saturday, this man will be attacked yet again by Tade.